Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor. I'm the RSA's Chief Executive, and I'd like to welcome you to today's RSA online event. Uh, I'm delighted to have the chance to talk today to Professors Anne Case and Angus Deaton, where they are, which is in uh, New Jersey, and is Professor Economics and Public Affairs Emeritus at Princeton University, where she is the Director of the Research Programme in Development Studies, and Angus is Professor of Economics and International Affairs Emeritus at Princeton University, and of course, winner of the 2015 Nobel Prize for Economics. Thank you both for joining us. Thank it's you for having us. It's a pleasure. Before we get into our conversation, there's so much to talk about, but just first, uh, how are you both and how is the crisis uh, for you? We're, we're anxious. Um, we worry a lot about the country opening up too soon. Um, we worry about 26 million people who have just lost their jobs and many of them then have also lost their health care. Um, we physically are fine. Uh, we're, we are staying, we're sheltering in place um, pretty happily. I haven't been outside the house for more than a month. Um, I'm an old guy, so I'm not allowed to go out, um, according to my wife, not according to the governor of New Jersey. <laughs> Um, but, you know, we spend a lot of our time together working at home. Um, so as far as that part of it is concerned, it's not very different from the usual for us. I think one of the challenges of this crisis is that on the one hand, it reminds us of our common humanity because we or our loved ones can all get this virus and we worry about it. But on the other hand, our circumstances are so different. For those of us who have reasonably nice houses or gardens and who are used anyway to working at home, we're knowledge workers. In some ways, there are bits of this you can even enjoy the quietness and enjoying nature. It's very, very different if you're economically insecure or living in uh, overcrowded accommodation with, uh, with children, at no access to a computer or whatever. It's really important, isn't it, for us to continue to remind ourselves of the very different circumstances people are going through. Oh, absolutely. Um, the idea that our minimum wage workers are essential workers, right? So we're putting them on the front lines. Uh, when I go to the grocery store, which I guess is not allowed to do, um, I always thank them for being there for us because it's a, it is a dangerous time uh, to be out with the public. And the public are oftentimes now themselves quite anxious, so they're not always the most polite either. <laughs> Yeah, so that, you know, we, we, our book is about less educated versus more educated Americans. And that divide has obviously gotten much wider um, through this COVID-19 crisis, just because, as you said, I mean, those of us who are knowledge workers, by and large, can shelter at home, we're safe, and we get paid. Um, whereas if you're at the other end of the spectrum, you're either an essential worker, in which case you're risking your life, or if you're not an essential worker, like a waiter or, you know, something like that, retail, um, you're likely to have lost your livelihood. So you're putting your life on the line or you're putting a livelihood on the line. While those of us who are, you know, at the other end of the knowledge work spectrum um, can shelter at home and have a nice time and not lose our incomes. So your book, um, which is an incredibly powerful book and has obviously been very influential developing a concept which has been very influential but it starts from the way that we can understand society through epidemiology through disease through mortality now of course in this crisis we are once again being reminded of the way in which disease sheds light on the nature of our society um what are the things that you think um, are most uh, most obvious, most powerful about the way in which this disease is highlighting aspects of our society? Well, it, it's certainly what you say is right. I mean, several people have used the term x-ray. It's sort of like you're seeing the society in another light, which highlights faults and cracks that you haven't seen um, before. Um, you know, as for mortality and morbidity and so on, being an indicator of society, I think we'd resist that a little bit, just because it, it's not the only indicator of society. I mean, a lot of what we've been trying to do, and I've been trying to do for years and years, is sort of bring, you know, doctors think health is everything, economists think money is everything, 
And somehow you have to balance them both. And that's become a very serious issue in the crisis, of course, as it is in our book, where both money and health inter- work together in a complicated way to determine the fate of people. Yes, and it's also the case, though, at the very beginning of, of this crisis, the Prime Minister of Great Britain gets sick, the heir to the throne gets sick. But that it only happened right at the beginning. Once we understood what was necessary to protect ourselves, those who have are able to do so, and those who have not are, are much less able to, as you say, because they live in crowded conditions where they must go to work. So I, I think it highlights that as well for us, that very rapidly this, this moved from something that touched us all, uh, movie stars, to something that is, is going to be um, really hurting people with underlying conditions. So it highlights the fact that those of us who are less well are at even greater risk for something like this. I remember that one of the points in your book is about smoking and how much more quickly middle-class educated people seem to kind of imbibe the evidence about smoking mm-hmm. and to change their habits. And it took a lot, a lot longer in less educated communities. And indeed, in some of those communities, the, the numbers are still kind of plateaued. I noticed in a much more kind of micro scale, some evidence in America that what television channels you watch seems to have some kind of influence on what you think is going on, and then how willing you are to undertake risky behavior. Mm. There's certainly a lot of separation going on. So it's a little hard to tell whether it's television that's doing it, or it's whether the political milieu and the people you talk to and the social media you listen to that determines what you watch on television. But it's certainly true, and that's certainly one of the most distressing trends is is that um, you know people at different ends of the political spectrum have different beliefs about the facts, um, never mind about what you should do about those facts. And I think, in, and in some ways, it's been a little bit hard for our book because, you know, if we're treading, you know, we're not way to the left and we're not way to the right, but the right don't like us because we're not condemning people, <laughs> condemning the victims for bringing it on themselves. And the left don't like us because we're not condemning inequality. And at least positions have become so entrenched that it's really hard to argue across it. And I think that's been hard for us. Do you think that that's one way in which the virus is different from the phenomena which you were talking about in your book, uh, uh, deaths of despair from alcohol, drugs, suicide, that that there were, it was possible for people to say, well, in some way that's down to people's choices. You know, that's not a social factor. That's to do with lack of character or... Now, you can't, you, you can't say that about the virus, can you? So in some ways... Oh, yes, you yeah. can. oh okay, okay. <laughs> I, I was working yeah. out some numbers yesterday, so that I, you shouldn't take these as gospel. But for instance, if, if you tabulate, there are 25 states in America that have a Democratic governor and 26 states, including the District of Columbia, that have a Republican governor. I mean, they're the chief executive in uh, the District of Columbia is Democrat, but that adds up to 51. So they're roughly split, okay? In the Democratic-headed states, there are four times as many deaths as in the Republican-headed states, right? I have to ask, what, why? Why, do you, why, is that, why is that? Well, you can think of lots of things. I don't think it's because they have a, a Democratic or Republican governor. Or you might say some Republicans would say this is a deserved plague upon Democratic blue states in America. But it's playing out in a way that, you know, there was this infamous statement that Mitch McConnell, um, the Senate Majority Leader, um, made the other day. And he said, I'm not in favor of bailouts for blue states. All right. And so this, the deaths themselves have become sharply politicized. It's, it, and it's, it's also the case that democratically headed states tend to be more populated. The population density is greater, which puts people at greater risk for the disease as well. So if you're out on the open plain and you don't see that many people in the course of a day, your risk of catching the disease is going to be much lower. So partly it's that it's been a bicoastal disease. 
something from Boston down through to Washington, D.C., or down through California. And the areas uh, that are more densely populated in the U.S. tend to vote more democratic. So. Yeah, so there's a lot of story. I mean, it's obviously not a simple causal story, but it does cut across that sort of inequality that you wouldn't necessarily have expected. And I wonder whether the same is true in Britain. I doubt it very much. And I doubt very much that on the, the news outlets that are more conservative in Britain, I doubt very much that they spent the entire month of February and, and the first half of March saying that this was a democratic hoax. Yeah. I mean, I guess in Britain that the, what you're seeing is the interplay of the physical characteristics which make you more vulnerable and social characteristics. And a bit like your conversation about heart disease in the book, it's quite hard to disentangle the degree to which this is, as it were, a kind of differential physical phenomenon or whether it's simply another reflection of social differences. So obviously older people, uh, obviously people with comorbidities, uh, clearly, uh, black and ethnic minority communities seem to be getting it worse. Now, we that's one of the big questions I don't think we know the answer to is, 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 is any of that to do with some kind of uh, physical uh, vulnerability, or is it simply that those people uh, will tend to suffer from other characteristics which make them more vulnerable? For example, in our country, they an awful lot of jobs in national health service are with black and ethnic minority people, and they are particularly in the front line. I mean, that's something it's going to take us a while to disentangle, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And the people are, but people are, it's not stopping people making um, very strong pronouncements, but uh, um, certainly in the US. And I imagine, but uh, the, you know, there's been this idea that the deaths from the COVID are proportional to pre existing mortality, which sort of explains why men are more likely to die than women and old people more than young people, but Hispanics are dying more in the U.S., and Hispanics have better health than whites, so that doesn't cut that way. And blacks have worse health than whites, and they seem to be doing worse, but the CDC seems to think that's mostly an area phenomenon, that there's large numbers of white people live where there are no COVID, or there is no COVID, and so they don't die because, you know, they're in Vermont. (laughs) Um, or they're in Nebraska where there's very little. So, but what you say, it's exactly right. We're going to spend years sorting this out. And, you know, provided we live that long, we're very much looking forward to being able to do that. We're also delighted to see, you know, that the, you would have noticed in the book, the last data we had were for 2018, 2017. 2017 in the book. And the 2018 data came out about a month ago. Today, we're getting these deaths data on a daily basis. <laughs> you know? So I got online in the morning and I sat down yesterday's date. So in the book, and I want to come to the book in a moment, but since you said that, Angus, what I think in the, in, well, in the book, you, you say that, that this enormous growth in the, these deaths by despair, the decline in the life expectancy of white working class people in America, uh, middle-aged people in America, it was starting to level off in your analysis. Has that continued, that, that, that leveling off? Yeah, you're the, more the expert. The that. leveling off of depths of despair? Yeah. So, yeah, the numbers for 2018 that just came out, drug overdose mortality fell a little bit, but deaths from suicide are still rising and deaths from alcoholic liver disease are still rising. Right. So we, it's way too early to know, for example, what COVID is going to do to those things. Um, but it probably is not going to look good. I mean, but there are some stories in the news now, and now they're just stories, which is that drug overdoses are up, in large part possibly because when you have overdose on opioids, there is something that can bring you back to life, but you need someone else present to administer it. Right. And, and so when we're socially isolated, that's much less likely to be the case. It's also true that, um, you know, isolation is the opposite of what is um, prescribed for people who have any sort of addiction, you know, even if they're not about to die. So alcoholics, drug addiction, whatever, um, you know, groups of one sort or another or seeing people is very important. Leaving people alone is very dangerous. 
And with suicide, we know that a correlate, a very strong correlate, is being isolated. So uh, we think that those things are probably um, going to worsen over the course of the next year. Um, but, that, that um, go ahead. Oh, sorry, that reminds me of um, the, the famous study of the Chicago heat wave, mm-hmm. um, which where the assumption had been that the death rate was to do with socioeconomic status, but the, the study, the detailed ethnographic study, going to every single person and finding out, showed that it was isolation that was a more important factor than merely socioeconomic status. And, mm-hmm. and these, I guess, are the things we'll find out. How much of a challenge is it for you as, as, as academics that people are wanting answers here and now? They're wanting to know, well, what are the lessons we should draw from this here and now? Whereas, you know, your work, you would normally want to take more time to be able to understand trends, to, to, to really be sure that the evidence is strongly based. Uh, how, how do you kind of handle the, the demand for instant judgment? One, I guess I have a couple of answers to that. One is that I tell people, anyone who tells you they know what's going on is uh, leaning too far out into the wind because we can't know what's going on. I mean, we can use the logic of why we think we got to where we are and um, see whether or not that that seems like it might hold going forward, but that without the numbers, it's really hard hard to know. But the other thing I tell people is that in 2018, uh, 158,000 Americans died from drugs, alcohol, and suicide. Under the radar, this is an invisible epidemic that's taking more than 150,000 lives a year. That's the upper bound of what we think COVID might um, deliver. And once there's a vaccine, that hopefully that shadow will be will have passed. But we'll still have this underlying problem that we have not dealt with um, at, after COVID is gone. Yeah, we try to resist the temptation to say what a lot of people are saying is the COVID crisis makes it even more important to focus on what we were telling you before. <laughs> Uh, and a lot of people are saying that about whatever was their pet hobby horse um, before. And But, you know, we've been studying death for a long time. We've been studying, you know, the social parlance of death for a long time. So, you know, if we're not going to be able to make semi-intelligent, semi-informed comments, um, then who is within our area of expertise? Um, and we try to avoid you know, unjustified speculation. But to come back to the numbers that Anne just gave, it's about 158,000 in 2018. Um, Of course, there are some suicides and people who die from drug overdose at normal time, but that's probably about 100,000 excess deaths. Relative to? To to some sort of normal. 1995. Right, so the the estimate of what COVID, the number of people going to die from COVID in the US is in the high 60s, maybe 70,000. And some of those people are very elderly people who might have died before the end of the year anyway, not not, by no means all of them. So that, you know, we're going to have this continuing crisis or it's not a crisis. That's that's part of the problem, as Anne said, it's under the radar of 100,000 excess deaths a year um, from despair. And that'll go on long after COVID is gone, at least we hope so. No, we hope no. that COVID's gone, not we the, the deaths. Yeah. Yeah. Um, th- this concept of deaths of despair has proved to be an incredibly powerful idea. Just... Tell me something about when it was that you decided that you wanted to write about this and, and what it, it is particularly about this phenomenon which, which made you feel it was so urgently important to describe it in the, in the really vivid and powerful ways in which you do. I'm going to hold your book up here. I've, I've been uh, reading it all week. It, um, it's a fantastic, uh, although often very kind of sobering book. But what was, can you remember the particular point at which you thought this is something we have got to talk about? Well, Anne invented the term, so you can talk about that. But it was clear when we discovered that midlife mortality was going up after 100 years of going down, all cause mortality, that we were into something, we were in over our heads, we had to sort of that sort of idea. So, you know, from the very first day, at least once we persuaded ourselves that it wasn't an error, 
you know, that we hadn't made a terrible mistake because at first it was very hard to believe that this was happening without everybody knowing about it. And so we must have done something wrong. But once, you know, we went on tour and talked to medical groups and we talked to economists and talked to people who work along this margin. And basically, you know, instead of saying, you idiot, you've misinterpreted the data, they, their jaws just dropped, you know. And so from that point on, I don't think there was any decision. I mean, I'm, there was some decision to write a book at some point because, you know, I've written books before. I don't know how much work it is. Um, but um, there was no doubt that we had to work on this. Yeah. yeah, and I think there are a couple of things. One is that what we found was that it was happening to the best educated community, the community that's always had the most privilege, um, which are whites in America. Usually if something bad is happening, it hits the African-American community harder than it hits anyone. But from the early 1990s through the mid-teens, mortality from drugs and alcohol were falling in the black community while they were rising in the white community, especially among whites without a college degree. So that also seemed kind of remarkable to us. It's a group that usually doesn't get a lot of attention because people rightly are worried about health equity between uh, races. And so the, the fact that white mortality was rising wasn't being noted. What was being noted was that the black white mortality gap was closing, which is important. But if it's closing because white mortality is rising, that doesn't seem to be very good. And I think the second thing for me is that I was really interested in, in looking at pain. And there's a whole chapter of our book devoted to pain, which is quite mysterious. Um, but pain is self-reported, right? Pain is whatever people say it is. And it's much easier just to just dismiss self-reports. Oh, those people are snowflakes, or oh, those people are just privileged. But when you have a body count, when you have the fact that these people are actually dying, I think it got a lot more attention because that is not a self-report. Right, that is um, something that is a lot more concrete, and that seemed like something that people were much more willing to take on board. It also seemed like a real place where social scientists were called, you know, because these are not, it's not a virus, you know, it's not a bacterium, it's not medical errors, though a big chunk of it, the pharma bit, you know, was caused by predatory pharmaceutical companies trading on despair um, to get rich, essentially. So, and but you know, that's like an economic phenomenon as well. I mean, it's an outrageous economic phenomenon, but it, it's, um, and so this was not something where doctors would say, look, you don't understand the virology of this disease, or you don't understand the transmission, or you don't know anything about uh, whatever. This is really a piece of social science in some sense. And, you know, very early on, it was clear that Durkheim was sort of our guiding light here. And this foundational document in sociology um, still has a lot to teach us and was a sort of way of looking at things. Um, and, you know, we, we spent a lot of time talking to sociologists and talking to non-economists, um, you know, including political scientists and psychologists, and that seemed, once again, something, a, a set of disciplines that were really useful for thinking about this phenomenon. I mean, it's, it seemed essential because we don't think necessarily about material well-being. It's the fact that without a job with prospects, without good wages, it's much harder to get married. It's much harder to um, have a stable home life. Uh, out of wedlock childbearing skyrocketed. People stopped going to church, which in America is a big deal. The institutions of organized religion are just really fundamental here. So um, it's, we needed to reach out to these other disciplines as well. And that seemed like a, a book was a good way to be able to do that. I mean, there, the, the, the book is so full of, of, of things that are so fascinating and we've got so little time. But so I, I, I want in a moment to to focus on some of the remedies that you talk about, some of the things that you think need to be done in the book and also relate them to, are they also things which might in some ways be, be things which, which become more possible in the context of, of coming out of the COVID 
crisis. But just one, one, of the, one or two of the things that struck me from the book is, is, is first that in some ways what preceded this opioid epidemic was a raising of awareness about the issue of pain. And that in some ways it's a reminder to us that sometimes the cure is worse uh, than, than the problem in a sense. That, that the very beginning of this was a well-intentioned attempt to get people to realize about pain. But unfortunately that was then seized by some pretty unscrupulous pharmaceutical companies. A second point I thought was really fascinating is that the debate that was taking place 25, 30 years ago about the African-American community's bad outcomes in relation to health and various other things. And the debate was, well, people on the left and progressives saying, well, it's to do with economic circumstances. And the people on the right saying, well, no, it's to do with lifestyle and values and character. Well, it, it, your, your book suggests pretty much that the first group was right, because once this economic tide starts to sweep up upon the white community, well, you know, hey, presto, the same or similar kinds of characteristics and problems start to occur. So I just say those two things, so it's just amongst the many things that are fascinating. But, but let's talk about what needs to be done. And we have to start with the health system. I mean, we feel blessed in Britain by our health system. Every Thursday night, I don't know whether you know this, but every Thursday night we go out into the street and we all applaud the health service and our care workers. And we have an immense sense of solidarity. Um, you're not so fortunate in your health system. Tell me how the COVID epidemic is shedding light on the dysfunctions of the American health system and what you think needs to happen to the health system if it's going to become better at treating American people. We sure hope so. <laughs> um, and there is a chance, you know, but it's always a catastrophe is always a very dangerous way of reform, you know, because as people have pointed out to uh, so, you know, there were catastrophes in the 1930s and America got Roosevelt and Germany got Hitler, you know, and it's hard to know which of those two you're going to get. And actually, the, the gaps that have become apparent now are a little different from the ones that we identify very strongly in the book. And the, the one in the book is just this, the burden of health care costs, um, which are A, so large, but they're B, worked through the um, employment system. And that that is destroying jobs and destroying good jobs um, for less educated people. What the COVID thing has revealed another, perhaps more obvious flaw, is that you know if you shut down the country and a lot of people lose their jobs, then they all lose their health insurance. Now they didn't all lose their health insurance because there are various backup schemes, but a large number of them did, and we'd find it very difficult to get back again. So that's like an obvious catastrophe too. But the other thing is these surprise medical bills, for instance. We think there might be some real chance that something might be done about that. This is this predatory behavior um, by doctors and um, ambulances who are taken over by um, private equity firms. Emergency departments. Emergency yeah. departments and, and ambulance services that are taken over by private equity. They're taken out of insurance. So even if you've got insurance for the hospital, you go to your own hospital where you have insurance and they bill you afterwards and you get these huge bills. And, you know, no one's been able to solve that because of the power of lobbying um, in Washington um, on both sides of the aisle. It's not just Republican lobbyists. And so, you know, if that happens through the crisis and people finish up with huge surprise medical bills, even though they went to hospitals where they were supposed to be covered, I think there will be just enormous outrage. There's also been physical changes. So like Cuomo has effectively socialized the healthcare, the um, hospital system in New York State. And that's gonna be very hard to reverse. Um, and so there will be changes from that source. But of course, we really don't know. And we always have to worry about Hitler versus Roosevelt. Can I ask you about another, um, because we're running out of time, I want to ask you about one uh, another powerful argument you make in the book. You, you're a pain to say that you're not anti-capitalist. Indeed, your earlier work, particularly, I think, Angus, yours was about the way in which capitalism, liberal democracy had been so good for our health and so good for our lifespans. But you want to say that there are problems now with the nature of modern uh, capitalism. Now, one of the things, I don't know if it's just been the same in the States, but here, there's been a lot of public feeling about how organizations and employers ought to behave and a lot of public anger towards corporations who don't seem to be behaving in reasonable uh, ways. I've been reading the last couple of days about 
about Disney and paying their dividends and paying their executives and seems to have caused quite a lot of anger, more anger than maybe you would have seen in normal times. So do you think that the other part of one of, one of your other areas of recommendation, which is that we do need to have models of capitalism that aren't rent-seeking, models of capitalism which are fairer in terms of the distribution of rewards and profits, is that something else which you think is an argument which might be advanced by what we're going through at the moment? It's, it is possible. I think the waters, though, are going to be so muddied by all of the things coming at us at once. But I think that to the extent that uh, people are angry about their medical bills and they begin, if, if they begin to understand, we begin to have a conversation about the fact that in America, so many hospitals have merged and, and instead of that lowering prices, that's actually increased prices. Or if people become cognizant of the fact that although the government paid the pharma companies over $3 billion to help them with vaccine research, the pharma companies were able to get the language watered down about making those vaccines affordable if they come online. But I think it means that we have to get that conversation going in the middle of the distribution where I think people still think of it as something complicated that they don't really want to think about. I mean, our concept of unfairness, I think it's a little different from the one you talked about. We don't think the income distribution being unequal is inherently unfair. Um, unfairness is that people lobby government to get special favors at the expense of the rest of us. And unfairness in that sense is pretty close to theft, right? And there's a lot of that goes on. Now, in the book, we tend to, we single out healthcare, you know, because we really don't think capitalism can deliver healthcare. And America is being too slow to, you know, too slow to learn that lesson compared with other countries. The rest of capitalism, corporate America, you know, has a lot going for it as well as a lot going against it. And I think that argument is still going on. And, you know, it's personified by companies like Amazon, for instance, where people get huge benefits from them and they're very worried about it at the same time. And, you know, that's a debate that's a very healthy debate and really has to go on. Well, that question of the kind of capitalism uh, we need is just one of the many fascinating issues uh, raised in the book. We, I, I could go on talking to you for hours and I do hope that when this is passed, we can get you to come to the uh, uh, RSA. But but for time for the time being, um, thank you very much, uh, Angus and uh, Anne, for giving us your time. Uh, Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism is a, is a powerful book. And as you've both been making clear, it's not a book which resorts to rhetoric in terms of its solutions, but thinks very hard about what might be what might work and what needs to be done. So thank you both very much. What a pleasure. Thank it's you. It's been a real pleasure. And I hope too that we'll be back in the flesh. And we'll see you in London. <laughs> thank you. Right. Before we sign off, a quick reminder to stay tuned to the RSA's channels in the coming weeks for all the latest online events and podcast announcements, as well as news from our policy research team and our 30,000 strong global network of fellows, many of whom are working together to bring about the better future we're hoping for on the other side of this crisis. Thank you again to Anne and Angus, and thank you all for watching. Stay safe. Thank you.